This is the Mac for the Blind Full 2022 Online Courses. This is course number four. This is all about uh, iOS apps and troubleshooting apps and iOS itself. Um, it's more, this is actually going to be probably more of a lecture kind of thing anyway. There really probably isn't an awful lot I can demonstrate per se, uh, as a lot of this is more theory and what you may or may not have encountered as you've used your iPhone uh, over the years. So the first thing I just want to you know, clarify here, as far as I iOS goes with any operating system, one of the things you have to sort of differentiate or understand is the difference between an operating system problem, an app problem, or simply a bug within the software itself. And this can be kind of a very difficult thing for most users because if you don't experience it or you don't really know what it is that's happening, it's hard to really deter determine. And what happens is normally it's just blamed on the operating system. And, you know, and that can, that can be very true. So obviously we have just, you know, recently had our upgrades to iOS 16. And I'm guessing that the vast majority of people on this, uh, in this presentation have done so. Um, at this stage, iOS 16, in my humble opinion, is certainly safe to update to. There have been situations such as iOS 8 and iOS 13 that, I, that come to mind where I was recommending to my clients not to initially update because of the numbers and types of bugs. But with iOS 16, uh, to, you know, in my opinion, there really isn't any showstoppers. There's some funny stuff that happens here and there with mail and, and in some other places. And of course, a great resource to find out about the latest state of iOS as far as known bugs and bugs that have been fixed with a new update is appleviz.com, A-P-P-L-E-V-I-S.com. So... The thing about iOS versions is they do come with the occasional bug, and sometimes the bugs are not reported or may not be widely known. They may be just a weird thing that crops up on your, you know, your specific phone um, compared to other people. I'm sure you've all experienced a situation where you, you, if you subscribe to the visually impaired iPhone list, the VI phone list, you might have people who post things about some weirdness that has happened, or you know, if you're in part of the beta tester groups, Cliff and Matt's beta tester, um, you know, email list, somebody might report an issue, and they're the only one having it. And it's like you get other people that chime in and say, "I'm not experiencing that on my end." So this is this is what makes the understanding of whether you're dealing with a serious problem or not the even more difficult. So one of the things that I try to recommend as far as steps go is ask around. That's the first thing. If you're on these lists, don't be afraid to post a simple question. This is, but be sure you describe exactly what's happening to you. You know, don't just say, yeah, weird things are happening in mail on my iPhone. Or on my lock screen on my iPhone, I, I don't understand what's going on. That doesn't really help. I mean, those types of emails really do not allow anybody to ascertain any specific information that might be able to assist you. So if you're going to pose a question, make sure you're very specific about what is happening. And even if you've tried things to try to work around it or figure out, you know, what's happening, just the more details and information you can present to other users, the more likely you're going to get help or you're going to get people to, that will either say, yeah, you know what, I'm having the same thing happen to me. Or you might have a bunch of people say, nope, not happening here. So you want to kind of try the list first, then try the Oracle, as my brother calls it, the internet, Google, Yahoo, whatever you use, whatever your search engine, DuckDuckGo. Just do some poking around. See if there's any information on the Apple knowledge, uh, on the Apple user forums. Maybe there is a discussion about what's going on that's similar to what's happening on your phone. 
Now, if there's still nothing happening, you know, the, you're not finding any consistency out there in the public about the weirdness of things that are going on with your phone, then you might want to, you know, start to kind of do th your own little troubleshooting. In other words, one of the first things you should do is reboot your phone. You know, just a simple shut the phone down completely, give it a minute or two, turn it back on again, see if the same issue occurs. If you're still having that problem, then do the soft reset. Um, and that's going to vary on your phone model. But generally speaking, with most of the newer phones, you have to quickly press the up volume, the down volume, and then press the power button and keep the power button pressed until the phone is forcibly rebooted. And that's, that's a more significant kind of restart. It's kind of like force restarting your computer in the sense that you're forcing caches to be cleared, um, you know, normalization, whatever you want to call it to happen. And that will usually fix anything that is kind of odd or strange that's going on with the phone itself. Um, in my experience, I've, I've seen that fix things like with Siri, um, where people have issues where all of a sudden Siri is not responding, you're not hearing the chime, or she keeps saying, uh, I'm sorry, I can't do that, or I, I, there is no network connection or something like that, even though you can tell from your Wi-Fi connection or your cell phone connection that you do have enough bars that it would normally work. So either just doing a simple restart or doing the soft reset usually will fix most of those types of problems. Now, if you're having a situation where um, audio is not consistently working, um, you know, the phone is strangely restarting or shutting down, you completely lose voiceover and you have to restart the phone to get voiceover back. You know, these are more, to me, in my experience, these are more typical signs of there probably being some kind of an issue <coughs> either with the device your, itself or an actual operating system problem. In other words, things that happen across the board. If you're experiencing something within a single app, then it's most likely going to be related to that app and not iOS itself. And that's another differentiation you have to make in terms of trying to figure out what's going on. Um, because there are things, it's just like with a computer, you know, there are problems that are going to affect, affect you throughout the use of your computer, no matter where you are, whether you're looking at the file system, uh, while you're, you know, you're running a word processor app, or, you know, you're looking at PDFs, you know, you just have consistent issues, no matter where you are on the system then that's more, most likely going to be related to the operating system of the computer or the computer itself. But if Microsoft Word is the only thing that's crashing on you or you're having problems saving documents or retrieving documents within Microsoft Word, but you can open them, let's say on a Mac with text edit, then you probably are having a more application specific thing. So, you know, that's one of the things that you need to differentiate right off the bat is trying to trying to, you know, kind of limit to where the problems are actually happening. Now, if it is an operating system related problem, you do have a couple of choices and it really comes down to how much this is aggravating you. If it's really a problem that is causing significant hardship, hardship and, and you're really just, you can't use your phone without this happening, or you can't get things done without it being a problem, then you might want to try doing the restore. And the rest restore you can do um, without a computer, but it's much easier to do it if you connect to a Mac or a PC, where you have a little bit more control from a perspective of accessibility. But a restore basically wipes your phone, reinstalls the operating system, and then hopefully, if you were smart, you had an iCloud backup that you can at least put your data back on the phone itself. So at least you can get the phone back to working condition. Now, there is a cautionary note I must mention here, though. When you do a restore, and you bring everything back from an iCloud backup, you are risking having the same problem return. 
That is the one sort of thing you have to be aware of if you restore your phone and you're trying to troubleshoot some kind of deep OS related thing. Because when you restore from your iCloud backup, you're also restoring a lot of the system files and stuff based on your account. And therefore, you might be bringing the same issue back with you. So just keep that in mind. Most of the time, though, from again, this is just from my personal experience. Um, usually a restore is going to fix most problems uh, because, you know, you are going to be reinstalling the operating system itself. And there are some files that come with that that have nothing to do with your iCloud backup. So that's why I always say it's worth going through that. It is a royal pain in the backside. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, if you get to the point where you have to restore the phone, it can be a little nerve wracking, especially if you've not done it before. But if you follow the steps and you take your time, you just, you know, just sit there and let it do its thing. It takes, uh, I would say a half hour, 45 minutes in total uh, from start to finish. And again, it's much easier to do this by way of connection to the computer, because if you do it on just the phone itself if you go into settings under general and you select the whole wipe the phone and restore process you probably are going to need sighted assistance a little bit maybe if you're not if you're a very confident user and you understand what's going on you should be able to simply get voiceover going once the phone does uh wipe itself and reboot and then you'll have uh, the, you know, the situation of uh, choosing whether you want to restore from an iCloud backup or anything like that. So, you know, that's the thing. You may ultimately have to go to Apple if you don't feel comfortable or confident enough that you can do a restore on your own. Or you might feel that, you know, you've done a restore and you're still having the same problems with the phone. Then it's time to go to Apple. And, you know, I know Apple stores are hit or miss in your locations. And some people I've worked with clients where a trip to the Apple store could be a two hour event, you know, back and forth. So, you know, it's sometimes easier to go to your provider, you know, whether you're using Verizon, AT&T, you know, whatever the case might be. But I always recommend, if at all possible, go to Apple because at least you're dealing with people who know the operating systems because at least they can do diagnostics. They can do software and hardware diagnostics and determine whether your issue might be related specifically to hardware. Um, I had that happen to me one time where I really had some weird stuff going on with my phone and it turned out that there was a problem with the hardware of the phone and they had to replace the phone for me. And that was the only way. Now, if it is like a software related thing, most likely Apple's going to tell you that, they'll, you know, to restore the phone, but you're going to have to bring everything back from scratch. In other words, you're not really going to be able to restore from your iCloud backup because that might be the culprit. That might be part of the issue. So, be prepared if things are really serious that you might have to take the time and really, you know, go through the frustration of setting the phone up from scratch. Now, that's not as terrible as you might think it is. The only real problem is resetting up accounts for specific applications and logging back in like your banking apps and things like that. But you can easily get your apps back. All you have to do is go to the app store select your account and your download history, your purchase history, and you will be able to manually re-download all of the apps that you wanted back on your phone. The only issue that might lead to is if you're like me and you love folders, you will have to create your folders all over again because it's not like the phone's going to go back to looking at the way you had it on your home screens. So that, you know, you're going to have to suck it up a little bit as the expression goes if Apple kind of sits, tells you, look, you know, it's definitely a software problem. So you're going to have to wipe it and just restore and start from scratch. You know, like I said, I've, I've been through that. I've done it once because Apple recommended and I did it a second time because I just felt it was the best thing to do. 
you know, it, it's just sometimes you get that feeling when you're a user and you know your phone and you know the way things behave and you've spoken to enough people out there and you've read enough information. Sometimes you just know that the problem is more uh, deeply rooted than just a simple software or quick, quick like reboot or soft reboot type of thing that will fix it. And you might just necessarily need to start your device from scratch. And that's, that's not an easy thing. I'm not at all trying to, you know, dismiss it as being, you know, oh, oh, it's okay. It, it, you only really should do that if it is absolutely necessary, you know. But, you know, if you have a computer handy and you're comfortable enough, doing a restore through, uh, through the uh, Finder now on the Mac and through the iTunes app uh, on the PC shouldn't be that difficult. I can't specifically speak of the PC. I have not used iTunes on a PC in a very long time, nor do I have the desire to do so. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, you can do a restore from the PC as well through iTunes in the same way that you can kind of, you know, you can do it on the Mac and just follow the steps. I just like to do it connected to a computer because at least I can quote unquote, see what is going on. In other words, the progress bar, you know, see what the message is. Is it preparing the update? Is it installing the update? You know, whatever is, happens to be happening. I can look at that LCD part of the um, the settings for for the, when you're looking at it through Finder, and I at least I know what's going on, and I can kind of gauge how much time I'm looking at for things to be completed. Now, if you do restore your phone from an iCloud backup, it is going to take some time. If you've the type of person like me who has got a whole bunch of apps on your phone. It's not an instantaneous thing. It may take quite a long time. In fact, it might take a good part of the day, depending on how much stuff you have on your phone. That also includes, by the way, any kind of different voices that you might have added to your phone. Um, you know, the one thing that I saw with a lot of people with iOS 16, when they updated is they lost if they were using like a non-standard voice like Alex or, you know, they downloaded, I don't know, Ava or Susan or, you know, one of the uh, the Australian or British voices. They initially didn't have that voice working, but eventually it does come back uh, because it's just a matter of your device needing to re-download. Um, I have run into situations with clients and myself where a couple of voices of the more unique voices, you actually had to go back and make re-download again. Uh, but for the most part, the ones that I had initially downloaded, let's say in iOS 14, 15, whatever, they, they just took time to come back. Uh, but it will take some time for things to kind of go back to normal if you're restoring from an iCloud backup. Now that does bring me to the subject of backing up your iDevice. Um, and it's the same lecture I would give you with a Mac. In, in, in regards to time machine, um, you know, you really should consider backing up your iPhone. Um, it's, you know, I guess it doesn't kick you in the teeth until you find yourself in a situation where something happens to the phone where you have to restore it. You lose the phone, you get a new phone, and you want it to be like the old phone. But guess what? If you've not backed up your phone, your you know, with iCloud and you ignored the little prompts that you got from your phone to, hey, you don't have iCloud backup turned on, maybe you should turn it on. And I get a lot of clients who just don't want to deal with it because they have to log in, they have to put their password in for their iCloud, their Apple ID, and that's too much trouble. So they just dismiss the screen over and over again. And then what happens is something unfortunate occurs and you have no backup to speak of. So it's very simple when you get your phone set up, if you have not done it yet, you go into settings, you double tap on the top of the screen where your iCloud, uh, in your Apple ID information is. So I will yeah. demonstrate that here. So at the top of your settings is your iCloud stuff, your Apple ID stuff. Some people, are aware of this and they know what it's all about and they do go in there. 
other people just kind of pass it over because they don't really know what iCloud is. They don't really want to know what iCloud is, et cetera, et cetera. But this is where you can turn on your backup. So I'm double tapping on that. Settings, back button. And I'm going to flick to the right. Apple ID, account image, John Panarese, Panarese at Mac name, phone number, password and security, book payment and shipping, subscriptions, book, iCloud, 250 gigabytes. iCloud. So that's what you're going to be listening for iCloud plus 109.1 gig Apple at iCloud. iCloud so again, I'm right flicking. Manage account storage. Apps using iCloud. Photos. All. iCloud drive. All. iCloud mail. All. Passwords and keychain. Show all. Button. Device backups. Heading. iCloud backup. All. Button. There's what you're going to be listening for. You, most likely, if you have not turned it on, it's going to say off. And then you're just going to double tap on that particular option. iCloud backup. Automatically back up your iPhone so you can restore your data if you lose So I'm it. flicking to the right. Back up this iPhone. Um, so there's the button. Back up this iPhone. And it's either going to be status is either going to be on or off. So if it's off, you want to double tap and make it turn itself on. Now, in theory, and I'm emphasizing here for those of you who know me, in theory, the way automatic backup is supposed to work is when you have your phone plugged in and you're on a Wi-Fi network, particularly overnight, the phone should back itself up automatically. However, if you even if you have turned this on and you feel or trust that things are happening behind the scenes without you needing to check, I would get into the habit every so often to go in here and just make sure that your latest backup is your latest backup. Backup over cellular when not connected to backup now button. Last successful backup, 1.55 a.m. So you notice my last successful backup was overnight at 1.55 in the morning. So I like to go in here every so often just to make sure it says something like that and doesn't say something to the effect of, you know, a week ago or 10 days ago. Now, what will typically happen is if for any reason your backups are not working, you will get a little love note from the operating system every so often that will tell you that something is going on with your backups and they're not working. What will sometimes happen is you'll get a corrupted file of, of some kind that will force or cause the backup to fail. So in this case, you're going to have to look at your backups and delete the backup and then manually force it to back up again. And that should um, that should cure the problem, uh, at least from you know experience that I just like, for example, I recently had with my niece where she was having issues with her backup. And I kind of walked her over, you know, while I was on the phone with her, walked her into how to, you know, get rid of the last backup and then get her backups going again. But theoretically, the, it should really be a seamless thing. And I and and from my experience, it's iCloud has only gotten better and better over the years. So you really don't run into the kinds of issues that you might have run into, let's say, five, six, seven years ago when iCloud was first being sort of brought onto the scene and pushed by Apple and things were not as seamless as they are now. And I know sometimes people also, you know, in this day and age where the media kind of reports any negative thing that happens in the cyber world as far as, you know, security breaches and people's accounts being hijacked and blah, blah, blah. But realistically, you know, as far as Apple is concerned or from my dealings with Apple, they are probably one of the most secure of the companies as far as cloud services go. So if you have concerns that using iCloud, you're gonna get ripped off or you know your data is gonna get stolen, whatever, it's really not that, it's not true. You know, it's, you know, most of us average mortals, for example, nobody's gonna be looking to steal our accounts, you know, hack into our accounts, you know, unless you're a politician or a celebrity or, of note, you know, somebody of note, that's that. That's when you wanna be, and, and remember the old expression, your account is only as secure as your password. You know, so if you use a password like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, or something that's very predictable for somebody who knows you, this is actually as kind of a side note, how a lot of these celebrities who get their, their accounts hacked, they use passwords that their fan base can figure out, like their birthdays, 
pets names, kids names, etc. So, you know, if you're going to, if you are somebody of note, you probably want to think very carefully about what kind of password you use to secure your account. And even if you're not a person of note, if you really feel that there's a risk out there, um, you know, you want to be pretty good with your password creation. Now, the other cool thing as a side note that Apple does is it will let you know if your password has been part of any kind of known data breach or anything that's happening on the dark web. And you can particularly see this if you go into settings under passwords and you look at the individual login information for the different accounts that you have saved if you're using the keychain system. And it will show you if a password has been part of a data breach. And it will give you the option of changing that password right there and then, or you know, you can always just ignore it and you know, take care of it yourself at a later date or just continue to use that password. Um, that's entirely up to the user. I have worked with clients who panic when they see, a, you know, and a piece of information that says that a password as as a part of a known data breach, blah blah blah. I I can't tell you whether you should change it or not. I I really don't like when people ask me that question because I am not a secure cybersecurity expert. I don't know what that means as far as if it's part of a known data breach. Does that really mean you're at risk? I don't know. Uh, I my specialty is not cybersecurity. I don't know if it means that you know your passwords like available on some great you know evil dark uh, list out there that goes around to hackers. I have no idea. So I what I say to people is well, you do what your gut feeling tells you to do. If you feel like you should change your password to something else, by all means, go and do go and do it. If you feel that it's okay and you're willing to take that risk, then that's fine. Like I will not change passwords unless it is like banking or something that is very, you know, personal in nature that, that, you know, I don't want to risk having, you know, being breached or whatever, you know, like Facebook account, uh, you know, whatever, that type of thing. But other things like shopping places and stuff like that it doesn't i'll take the risk because it's just you know to go and change passwords on every single website sometimes is just that's an exercise and time consuming frustration in my humble opinion but again i th always throw that out there to the uh, to the user to make that decision i i really don't want to be responsible for making a decision for whether you should change your password or not so again, you know, to kind of summarize things here, you know, you definitely want to turn on your iCloud backup. Um, you know, it's it's not easy to back stuff up manually. You know, you can use the Files app in certain instances and and iCloud Drive as a as sort of a manual way to back up certain things, but you don't have the easy ability to back your phone up in the same way that you have in terms of like a Mac where you use time machine or you connect an external drive and you, you know, you dump, you know, the stuff from your documents folder onto an external drive. That's like, I, that's general, you know, overall iOS issues and trying to differentiate. And just remember the difference between a bug and an actual software problem. You know, bugs are just there, you know, they're going to happen they crop up no matter what this yearly cycle which i i know some of you probably know my personal feelings about these companies that are doing yearly you know uh, operating system updates and stuff and i think it's just creating more problems for the user base and i'm not just talking about apple you know i'm talking about every company now and their creation seems to you know have gone to the yearly update for everything you know, whether it's uh, Android or, or Windows or whatever, you know, I just think that's a disservice to their user base in the long run because you haven't even squashed bugs in the current operating system. And then you're moving on to a new operating system where those bugs are either carried over or new ones are created. So I just think that if companies went to maybe a two-year cycle, it might make it a lot better for the user experience overall, but 
that's my opinion and obviously not the engineers and companies out there. So we're kind of stuck with what we got. So you want to be aware of what bugs are out there. And as I said, email lists, going to appleviz.com, just doing some general checking around in different forums should give you an idea of whether you're dealing with a bug or something that is much more you know, insidious as far as like a, a part of the operating system that needs to be fixed. Now, as a voiceover user, just as kind of a, a, a thing to point out to most people here, I'm sure most of you probably know, but I, I, I don't know. If you're having issues with voiceover, honestly, the easiest fix is a simple reboot. So people go crazy sometimes and they, they do the soft reboot. They, they talk about restoring, uh, resetting their voiceover settings, going into the accessibility and settings and, you know, and under voiceover and resetting things. Don't don't do that unless the reboot doesn't fix the voiceover issue. But I will tell you from experience from both myself and working with people for the last 13 plus years, I can't think of an instance in which rebooting the phone didn't fix a voiceover related problem. Now, the longer you keep your phone up, the uptime on your phone, you are most likely going to see weird stuff happening with voiceover. I just want you to be aware of that reality. Um, it's hard to predict exactly what you're going to experience, but trust me from somebody who sometimes doesn't reboot boot his phone as regularly as he should, I can tell you that weird things will start to happen with voiceover. You'll start to get the um, uh, sort of the max headroom side of sort of thing where it just kind of repeats itself. It just kind of cyborgs out a little bit here and there. Sometimes uh, it, it doesn't play nicely with different par apps and different parts of the operating system. Um, you know, you have all kinds of problems like that. And just, as I said, a simple reboot uh, will, you know, definitely fix the problems. I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, um, you know, going into voiceover settings and resetting things back to factory defaults is sometimes too much of an extreme. Uh, when a simple reboot can just take care of things for you. Now, another side note that I want to bring up to folks, too, in regards to voiceover um, also has to do with the other accessibility features on your phone. Just be careful. If you are a new user or you know people who are new users, really try to encourage them to be very careful um, you know, when you're learning the gestures and you're exploring your phone screens, that's a great thing. I, I certainly am not discouraging people from learning their device and, and, you know, and getting accustomed to navigation and such. But be very aware of what you're doing. And because the point that I'm going to try to make here is you can turn on things completely by accident that interfere or affect voiceover in negative ways. Some of the accessibility features don't play well in combination with voiceover. The one that I'm going to point out to you is voice control. I've had this happen now to three different clients in the last year for some reason. They accidentally, well, two out of the three cases, it was accidental. The third case, it turned out the guy did it because he thought that voice control and voiceover would be a neat little package to use and you know, make, make, enable him not to have to use his gestures. Now, let's just say this, voice control is primarily designed for people who physically cannot use their iPhone or iPad. These are people who are in wheelchairs. These are people who are para quadri uh, para paraplegics, quadriplegics, those types of situations. Voice control is their key to using their device. But keep in mind that these people typically have vision. Now, what happens when you use voice control with voiceover is the way screens appear for a sighted person, a sighted person is often in a situation where they pick a screen or an option by way of numbers. So everything is got a number in front of it. Now, what happens with voiceover is voiceover reads all this stuff and reads continuously because at the same time, 
voice control is picking up what voiceover is saying. And sometimes what voiceover says is treated like a command. So you get this really major mess and applications do not behave properly in the least. And you have no clue because as one of my clients said it, it was like my phone became possessed. And that's the only way to describe it because it really seems as though somebody else is using your phone. And she panicked because she's one of these people that just doesn't know better. So she literally thought that the government took over her phone and was spying on her and, you know, whatever, whatever you can, I'm sure you can figure that out where that went from there. So I, the first time this happened, it, it was really strange because I thought this was specifically a voiceover issue. So I tried everything. I rebooted a phone. I did the soft reset. Um, nothing. And I went into voiceover settings. I reset some settings. And at one point I thought I found the problem, but then it just started cropping up again. And finally I was like, you know what? I got to look at accessibility settings. So I literally went through the list of accessibility setting, settings one at a time until I stumbled across the voice control and it said that it was toggled on. And then the light switch went off in my brain because I'm like, oh, I remember reading about this. And once I turned it off, of course, everything went back to normal. So my, you know, the thing here I wanna kind of emphasize, I, I, I know there are blind people that are intimidated by gestures, by the, um, the virtual keyboard and typing on their phone, and they would much rather use Siri, they would much rather use dictation, they'd much rather use voice control. And, and I get it, I'm not criticizing anybody. It's just the reality of the situation, to my knowledge, and, and I've read in places that, that Apple is trying to make voiceover and voice control sort of behave more nicely. But from my personal experience, that has not been the case at all. And what I try to say to blind people as tactfully and politely as possible is you have the ability to use the gestures and work the phone without voice control. And it's you put the barriers up, not the phone. You know, if you're a blind person who does have physical limitations for specific reasons, that's a different that's a different story. And, you know, that's that's a, a matter that that, you know, is beyond what I'm saying here. I'm not criticizing you if you're in that situation at all. I'm talking about an able bodied blind person who has the ability to use gestures, who doesn't, you know, who only limits themselves by fear or whatever it is that's going on inside of them. So I try to encourage people as much as I possibly can to just go by way of the gestures or, you know, use a Bluetooth keyboard or a braille display, you know, in tandem with, with your phone, that's, that's fine. But don't use your blindness as a, uh, as a crutch, as far as like, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm not the sharpest tool in the tent in the, sh the, the box all the time. If I can do this stuff, as I say, if this moron can do stuff, can do stuff on my phone, I think anybody should be able to do it. So, you know, voice control can just be, you know, a real nightmare and it can create a lot more problems than you might even imagine. And sometimes that's at the root of problems that you're having with voiceover. And there are other accessibility peach, uh, features like, um, uh, what is that, uh, assistive touch, and stuff that can get turned on that can really make your experience using your phone uh, a little more <laughs> interesting. So just be aware of not turning on the accessibility features unless you absolutely have a reason to do so, or you know you need them yourself for you know your specific situation. And then if there is a conflict or a combination that is not working for you then you might have to call up the Apple Accessibility 800 number and, and speak to an advisor and see if they would have a solution or an approach for you that might work, you know, might be able to alleviate whatever issues you're having. So, you know, that's a time to call Apple Accessibility. Um, and 
while I'm on that subject, I will not name any names by any means here, but I was asked by a representative of Apple to just pass along the message to folks that please use the accessibility number only for accessibility issues. If your problem is a more general situation or a sales problem or an iCloud password issue or a login issue, then use the regular, um, the, uh, you know, the Apple care number. What is it? 1-800-MY-APPLE or whatever it is. Uh, because the accessibility line is really meant specifically for accessibility related issues. And they've just had a lot of, of an influx lately of people calling that have nothing to do with accessibility problems. You know, it's just, it takes up their, you know, these advisors are technically, theoretically trained to deal specifically with the accessibility features of the iPhone, the iPad, the Mac, the watch, whatever the case may be. Uh, and I'm saying, you know, technically and theoretically, because I know somebody will come on to this presentation at the end and give me a story about how the representative didn't know jack crap about voiceover or something like that. And I'm aware of that. But, you know, in theory, the accessibility line is supposed to be um, what do they call them, tier two or whatever advisor, advisory uh, positions of people that are trained to have used voiceover in some capacity. All right, so let's move on to apps themselves. Now that we've talked, um, you know, about the operating system, let's talk specifically about apps. So let's first distinguish the, the difference between an accessibility, a shortcoming of an app and a bug or a problem with an application. So one of the first things, as I think I've, I've said in lectures I've done about, you know, apps in iOS, and we, I think I did a thing about, you know, recommending third-party apps that are great for accessibility and, and you know, independence and self-reliance. You want to make sure that the app you're downloading, particularly if you're dropping money on it, you want to make sure it works with voiceover. It plays nice with voiceover. So again, my good friends at AppleViz.com, uh, they will typically have a lot of information. If you just do a general search about an app's accessibility, you should be able to get some details and find out whether an app is accessible or not. My philosophy too, and this is my philosophy, is if it's a free app, the only thing you're going to waste is your time if it turns out not to be accessible. If you end up dropping money on an app, it's not that you can't get your money back. You can. If you contact Apple support through the store and you tell them through the app store and you explain that you're a voiceover user, you purchased this app because you thought it would be useful, but it does not have voiceover accessibility in it they will refund your money. So don't think that, you know, you're stuck, but to avoid that headache of having to contact support, the first rule of thumb is be sure that you know that application is accessible or at least accessible enough that blind people can use it. Let me differentiate. An accessibility versus, you know, an actual application problem. If your application starts and crashes, or hangs where all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> you're on this one screen and you can't seem to get anywhere else on that screen, or the app is like in the process of doing something and just hangs. You just see the, um, I forget what that message it says, uh, loading, or there's another message it uses. You know, if that just continuously happens, then you might be forced to have to restart the phone. Um, you know, sometimes an app will hang like that and your only recourse is to either try to turn the phone off through normal methods. In other words, hold the down volume and the power buttons together until the screen pops up that says, you know, uh, power, double tap to power off. Um, if that's not working for any reason, then you might be forced to do the hard uh, reset, or I should say the soft reset, where you do the up, down volumes, press quickly in succession, and then press and hold the um, the power button until the phone kind of forces itself to restart. 
But generally speaking, getting the phone to restart, just like I said about voiceover issues, they will normally fix apps that hang or, you know, now if the problem persists specifically with that app and you keep running into the same problem, then you may want to delete the app entirely from your phone and re-download it. Remember, if you have bought or you have gotten it for free, it is in your account purchase history. You do not need to go back and try to purchase it again. Even if you have purchased it and you just go the regular way of doing the search and finding the app, it's going to say re-download instead of you know, giving you a price. So in other words, you're not going to be forced to buy an application that you've already purchased in the past. The only way that might be different is if the developer has come out with a new version of the app that they have considered to be chargeable. Uh, I've seen that happen in some occasions where an app developer has, you know, it's been like, you know, three, four years since they've really had a major update. Now they got this new cool version of the app and, you know, they may not charge full boat if you've already, you know, purchased it in the past. You might get a discount off or whatever the full price is. Um, but, you know, it, it re erasing an app, deleting an app and re-downloading it a lot of times will fix stubborn app issues where you have crashes or hang, you know, apps that hang. Um, sometimes it could be a voiceover related bug, you know, that is like sort of a feature that happened, not a feature, but a thing that happens across other applications as well. Um, I know that you know, like when I was beta testing different versions of iOS over the years, you'd have situations where focus problems would crop up where if you're, you know, you're flicking through an app screen, all of a sudden you'd get stuck in one spot and you couldn't go beyond that one spot. You just get the thunk, 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 thunk as you try to do it. But meanwhile, if you slide your finger further down the screen, you know there's more uh, content there that you're not seeing by way of flicking. I've seen this happen, but this is not necessarily always an application related thing. This might be a voiceover bug. Um, though, you know, with that, not to confuse the matter, with that being said, sometimes you have apps that just, you know, they might be accessible, but they just are having issues with voiceover. I'll give you a great example, DoorDash. Um, there was a time when my brother, God rest his soul, was still alive. And um, I used to order, have to order, you know, lunch and dinner. At Messages, Julia Christensen, hey us. there. Um, but, you know, what would happen with certain updates with the uh, DoorDash app is there would be situations where I, you know, just I couldn't see the the choices for the restaurant, the menus by flicking. I'd flick to the right, flick to the right. And it would seem like there was nothing there or it would just stop at a certain point. But if I took my finger and I went further down the screen and I started swiping around, then when I started to flick, it would show me the rest of the stuff. So that seemed to be, though, specific only to DoorDash. That wasn't happening to me in other apps. So I kind of was able to, by process of elimination, you know, because I'm just that smart, that um, it definitely was related to DoorDash. The, the point, I'm not trying to confuse people here, but you need to kind of by process of elimination, figure out what the problem is you're dealing with and how serious it happens to be. You know, you're going to run into issues. That's the bottom line working with these devices. Things just do not go, you know, uh, uh, you know, 100 percent without any anything, anything weird, unexpected occurring. You know, it's just the reality, the nature of the beast is you're going to run into something. It's determining whether you're dealing with just a bug, whether you're dealing with a, uh, you know, a more significant problem or something that is specific only to that application. And this is where you become sort of the detective. You know, you kind of have to put on that, that Dick Tracy hat for a little bit and, and kind of ascertain what is actually going on and when it's going on. You know, especially if you are a hoarder of apps, and I know some of you out there are, because I've spoken to some of you privately, and I know you're like me. Um, you have more apps than you probably need, or any you know mortal 
human being would probably be using at any given time just because they're there. And by having all these apps, you probably experience a lot more of the gamut of, of different types of fun stuff than the average user does. And, you know, what it, it's kind of interesting that, you know, from my experience teaching people, the folks who use a wide array of apps and go out there and adventure and try different things, they usually are a lot more tolerating and easygoing and understanding of, you know, what is an app problem, what is an iOS problem than a user who really is very limited in their experience. I know that's kind of logical, but that's kind of what happens. You know, I have always found that the users who really panic and make the biggest fuss uh, on lists or speaking to me are usually the folks that really don't have a wide range of experience of using apps. And I guess because of those of us who use a wide range of apps and we experience so many different situations using those apps, we kind of recognize or accept when there's going to be problems and we don't necessarily panic because we know, you know, what we're dealing with, I guess, you know, it's like, you know, knowing what the monster in the closet is, is, you know, a lot easier than just opening the closet door and being shocked, you know, when it's there. So that's kind of how I see this as far as like my experience working with people, you know, over the last 13 plus years. So, you know, Usually in the blindness community, if there are issues with specific applications, you're going to hear about it. You know, blind people are pretty expressive in a great way in the sense that, you know, usually there's a lot of warning. You know, we're, we're re rarely ever going to get caught with a tsunami that just sneaks up on us. Report problems, particularly accessibility issues to the developer. But do it, do it in a courteous, polite, professional manner. You know, when you can get a dialogue going with a developer and you make a developer understand that there are blind people who need use of their app, they're reasonable in most cases. If you attack them, if you just like, you know, take this holier than thou approach and how dare you not have your app accessible, it's 2022, what the heck is wrong with you? That's not going to get you really far with a lot of people. You know, that old expression about you get more bees with honey than vinegar. That's kind of how you have to do this. And if you do run into issues with an app, try to be very detailed. Like I said, when you deal with Apple accessibility and you're reporting bugs, the same rules should apply to dealing with third-party developers. You want to make sure that they know what you were doing and what was happening and why it's not working with voiceover. The more detail you give them, the better it's going to be for them to try to fix the problem or, or add something to the app that makes it work with voiceover. You know, it's just really just being, I guess, just being courteous or whatever the term you want to use. Because most people, especially the one thing, and, and I know some people are going to yell at me, whatever, but from my experience, Working, you know, being around the blindness industry as far as the iOS and Mac world compared to the Windows world, it seems that to me, and this is my personal opinion, that Mac and iOS developers tend to be a lot more approachable and understanding than Windows developers. I don't know why that's the case. Maybe it's because Apple does preach accessibility so much in the Worldwide Developer Conference. And on their web pages for developers, maybe that's the case. I, I don't know. But just from dealing, and, and I've dealt with several developers over the years. Um, one of the greatest stories I can tell you is if those of you who use the Mars Edit app uh, for the Mac, Daniel from Red Sweater, that guy I can't say enough great things about how, how well that guy has responded to voiceover use and making sure that every update to that app has voiceover compatibility. And if it doesn't, he is right on it. And he wants to look at logs and he will walk you through any workarounds that you need in, in the meantime until he fixes the problem. So, you know, and there's other developers I've worked with in the iOS world I can say the same thing about. So we will open the floor to some questions here in the last 
bit we have? I want to know, uh, sometimes when you go into different places on your phone and you want to copy uh, information so that you can share it with other people, sometimes you can't find the place to be able to copy it. You know, like I do the rotor in order to try to see. Sometimes that copy function will be there, but I guess sometimes it's not. How do you... um, I'm just going to give you a specific example. Like if I'm on Facebook and I want to copy something, do you know if there's a way to copy and then um, send it? I have done copy and paste in the past, but sometimes I can't find how to copy something. If it's something that is spoken, if you have voiceover, say it, and then you do a three finger quadruple tap, Mm-hmm. That will automatically copy the last spoken phrase to the to the pasteboard. And then you go to where you want to paste it. You turn the rotor to edit and you flick to paste and double tap. And oh. that should, it, you know, again, it's going to yeah. be based on what it is you're actually having voiceover read. It's not like oh. if you're trying to copy an image, that's probably not going to work. But if it's like mm-hmm. a, a text related thing or a, right. like a link you know, it'll read HTTP colon slash blah, 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 blah. But at least if you do the three, you know, the three finger quadruple tap, it will actually copy the link and then you can paste it into, you know, whatever. Okay. So that's one way I've worked around those situations. Yeah. You don't, uh, what is it? The, the voice control. How about speak screen? Have you had any luck with that whatsoever? That seems to mess That's everything. That's really up. not a blindness thing either, because it's really okay. it's, it's two two populations there. You have low vision people who need some help reading, like an article or whatever. Um, and what happens is the way Speak Screen works is you highlight the text, and then there's a Speak button you tap yep. on. So the problem with this is it's a, it's a one shot deal. It just reads what you've highlighted. You can't control yep. word sentences. You can't go back, you know. So it's really for the low vision person or a learning disabled person who needs to have that read to them because they can't. Maybe they're dyslexic or whatever the case may be. So those are really the populations that benefit, I guess you'd say, from that particular accessibility, you know, feature. Uh, voiceover okay. and that's what I recommended it yeah for yes. vision folks the other one is it, it's the one where you speak and it makes the buttons that are the, the ones that aren't labeled labels them what's that called and yeah that's, that's screen screen recognition yes the screen recognition but again that is not a it, it's it's not something that works foolproof because there are a lot of factors that will affect whether it, it actually gets those buttons right. <laughs> that's, I usually that's tell people, turn, go and turn that blasted thing off. Yeah, I, mean, I don't you know, know if again, you had if any success ex- with it. If you're an experienced yeah. user and you know what you're dealing with, so to speak, you know, some of this stuff you can kind of, you can kind of hack your way through it. But, you know, I always like, I try to keep it simple for people. In the beginning, especially, you know, because if you if there's too many things, too many moving parts, you know, yep. it can end up really tripping them up and, and, and really making the experience far more frustrating than it needs to be. You know, so I, I am very much a believer in just really keeping it very basic foundational, as I like to call it. And then, you know, when you get your feet under you and you feel more and more confident, then by all means, try things out. Again, I thank you for attending. Thank you. And uh, we will, for those of you who've signed up in, in two weeks, we will move on to the course number five. Remember, for all Mac, iOS, and any kind of Apple training, visit MacForTheBlind.com. John Penn and Reese has some free courses and some reasonable paid courses. You won't be disappointed. See you next time.